What's going on guys and welcome back to the Good Boys YouTube channel. We got a chilly fall morning. It's really beautiful for working out in the garage. So today we're going to tackle a few things on the Hawk 250. We're going to be replacing the rear wheel, the rear shock. And stick around. I am going to be sharing with you guys some of the things that I learned about the rear wheel. And I've actually got a decent little list of things to go through. All right guys, so real quickly, I just wanted to cover a question that I'm sure that's going to come up. And I'm sure you guys will all be asking, why are we taking parts from a low mile Hawk and putting them on this 8,000 mile turd? You're not a turd, baby. You're not a turd, you're a gym. The reason parts are coming off of that low mile bike and being put on this bike is because this bike is set up the way I want it. And I'll talk about this uh, a little more later on in the video. Oh, she's a heavy girl. <clears throat> Go ahead and take the rear wheel off. Go ahead and take the chain off, get it out of the way, and then the rear wheel just kind of comes out of here. You have a spacer on the sprocket side, which we have a worn out seal so it's going to fall out and then you have of course the caliper we're going to go ahead and just get all the parts off of here that we're going to be replacing you need to remove this plastic so some of this stuff that you guys see me pulling off here is not factory like this spring um, it got moved to a different location from the factory this spring sits down here. And the issue with that is, is that it gets caught and it gets torn off of there and lost. So um, this is actually a pretty nice little modification. This whole thing in general is pretty worn out. Um, all these little linkages up in here and pins are worn out. So it takes a lot to get the rear brakes to, um, to come alive. You gotta really press the pedal down quite far. And there is a washer and this whole thing just slipped out up here for the reservoir two eight millimeter bolts on the swing arm for the uh i'm gonna call them retainers for the brake line and that's it the entire rear brake assembly is off of there we can go ahead and remove the rear shock I So, um, aside from it being bent, obviously, you can see that uh, it's rusty and crusty. If this didn't have grease on it, this would not be coming out of here at all. All right, so now our rear shock is free from the swing arm. Now we will pull this side cover off. So we also have to pull this off to get to the shock. Hopefully you guys can see what I can see. I've got a pry bar and I'm gonna use a fulcrum point. So we're gonna put this bolt back in here so the pry bar can't slip off. So let's go ahead and take a look at all the parts we pulled off. Um, we'll just quickly go over what failed and a few lessons that I've learned um, from working on this stuff and dealing with it for over 8,000 miles now. First of all, the rear shock. This did really great. It actually works surprisingly well, although the back end is a little stiff. Uh, I have a feeling it has something to do with mono shock. So all the mono shock means is that the shock directly attaches to the rear swing arm instead of going through a series of linkages like what most dirt bikes have. Here, I'll show you. On this Yamaha TTR 230 here, 
you can see that the rear shock does not actually attach to the swing arm. It goes to this bracket here or whatever you want to call it, a cam or whatever. It goes through a series of cams. Um, so it has a different angle kind of, of attack and it totally changes how the rear shock acts and interacts with the rear swing arm. So this is your typical regular setup that you're going to see on every single dirt bike ever made. This right here is a new concept that they just came out with. And I have a feeling they put it on this bike just because it's cheap and easy. Um, but this shock lasted about five or 6,000 miles before it actually blew out. So just to be clear, what I mean by the rear shock blew out is that the seals in there actually uh, blew out. And what happens is it leaks all your oil. You lose all your shock oil and then you don't have any shocks. It's kind of like when you see a car going down the road, they hit a bump and they keep bouncing forever down the road. That's what happened to this thing. So the factory shock actually lasts a decent amount of time considering um, how rough this thing has been ridden. Um, I've definitely seen worse um, even on Japanese bikes. The only thing that really goes bad with it is that, um, you know, if you're jumping it or riding the bike uh, like you're supposed to, this is what happens to the bolt. It bananas. So that's the rear shock. Let's talk about this stuff here. So, um, again, like 8,000 miles. It's a pretty respectable amount of miles, um, especially for a Chinese bike. Stuff wears out, uh, like I said, even on Japanese bikes. But uh, what happened with this is basically the bushings, which are pretty much just uh, rubber stuck in these holes, have worn out and it caused this thing to chatter. So that's one thing that went wrong. Um, another thing, obviously the electronic switch um, got corroded out from road salt and water. Uh, as you guys know, my bike sees a lot of water. Another thing, we did flush this rear brake system once or twice, put new fluid in it. Um, after a while, you just can't keep the fluid clean. Um, although this, I mean, it is brake fluid. It's just the appearance is a little bit dirty, um, but it's been flushed recently. So what happens over time is with that dirty fluid in there, even if you um, keep washing it out, washing it out, washing it out, your pistons get dirty and dirt and contaminants get into your piston. And, uh, and the actual pistons, and um, I don't know if you want to call it a master cylinder or whatever, but basically the pistons inside both of these get worn out and um, you have to push the brake pedal a lot further down. And even I had to pump this up towards the end of 8,000 miles that it was on there. One last thing, uh, obviously, like I said, all these little joints and pins and things wear out. I mean, it's just, it's gonna happen, um, especially when you have dirt and water and stuff in here constantly. It's just going to wear out. So that is the rear brake system. So what did I learn about this? Um, there's not too much you can do to keep this stuff maintained. Obviously grease this joint and uh, flush out your brake fluid from time to time and that's it. When it wears out, it wears out. The rear wheel. There's a few more things to talk about with it. So, um, where should I start? So we'll talk about the spokes. The spokes obviously do come loose. If I had this to do over again, I would probably get a wheel truing tool. If you don't know what that is, it's something that you put your wheel up on and it's got a shaft that goes through the center of the wheel and you can spin the wheel around and it's got two pointers and Basically, when you spin your wheel around, you can true the wheel. So those two pointers um, are in one spot, you adjust them, and as you're spinning the wheel around, it's either straight or it's not, and by adjusting the spokes, you can straighten the wheel. So one thing I wanted to mention with bearings. Um, in some previous videos, I said that you can't have too much grease in the rear axle here. Um, so that's kind of true, but kind of not. One thing I have noticed is if you put too much grease in here, it will actually wear the bearings out from all the resistance of the grease. Um, another thing, um, this rear bearing here has actually gotten wallered out on the inside of the hub. So what happened here is that this thing wasn't really all that tight from the factory. The bearing actually 
um, easily slid in and out. And you can see that in some of my very first videos. When this thing was brand new, it just wasn't a great fit. So over time, grease has been in here and then that combines with dirt particles and dust particles and that bearing wears out. And it's hard to show you guys, but the actual bearing has clearance, um, a decent bit of clearance to the actual hub. So, I mean, in the future, if I come across a bearing that doesn't fit exactly right, I will not be greasing the outside of the bearing. Don't put too much grease in your rear end. Um, just put a little bit in there to keep the water out, a little bit on the seals, and it should be good. Um, bearings are another thing. When they wear out, they wear out. You just you have to replace them, and um, sometimes too much grease is not a good thing. You want to be careful with this sprocket when you're putting it on here. So one of the issues that is a little funky that I think a lot of hawks have is that the, uh, the bushings, the dampening bushings that are behind these bolts, some of them don't like to go in all the way, and so it, it makes your sprocket seem uneven. Well, I was trying to get these pushed in there some more by hammering on the end of the studs, and I actually ended up breaking um, this machined, it's the hub, hub actually broke, and it it's this machined um, flange that actually has your, um, snap ring on it and that's what actually holds a sprocket on so that's a a bad thing to have happen and that's why we have these wire ties on here you do have to keep up with these uh little nuts on here granted i do grease everything so these are greased so i have to tighten them down pretty good and even with that being said uh they still do come loose from time to time so just keep after these and it's just something to keep in mind one other thing I do want to mention is that the dampening bushings are absolutely necessary. You have to have them. The ones that come in the bike are not good. Uh, they last about a thousand miles and then they're completely roached. So I did come across a set of Japanese dampening bushings for the sprocket. So I will link that in the description box below. So like I said, I put these bushings in here at a thousand miles when the originals went bad and these have lasted the entire rest of the time I've had the bike. Haven't had to touch them again. So the key to this is buying high quality sprocket dampening bushings. Um, and so obviously you're gonna have to go with something that's Japanese made. So what I'm gonna be linking in the description box below for you guys are the Japanese bushings that I actually used. They'll be linked in that description box below. Don't forget to go check that description box out. So one last thing that I learned over the years is that a rim lock is absolutely necessary. So there's two ways you can go wrong without a rim lock. So number one is that you can have too low tire pressure and the rim spins on the tire. The second way is if moisture or water gets between your rim and your tire. So let me just be very clear here. Your tire can be fully aired up. I mean, you can have 15, 20 PSI in here. It doesn't matter. When you get moisture between the rim and tire, if you're putting enough power through the rear end of this thing, say you're dumping the clutch, you're gonna have a situation again where the rim spins on the tire. So what happens when the rim spins on the tire is that your valve stem gets ripped out of your tube. To oversimplify this for you guys, if your valve stem gets ripped out of your tube, that's no bueno. That means you lose all your air in your rear tire. So how does a rim lock fix these problems? Well, basically what a rim lock does is it locks the tire to the rim. So the rim can no longer spin on the tire, okay? So even if your tire goes completely flat, if you have a rim lock, the tire is gonna stay with the rim. It can no longer slip. So this can also be useful if you do actually get a puncture flat um, you're on the trails and instead of the rim just spinning on the tire, you can make it back to your trailer or um, wherever you're parked because the rim lock will actually hold the tire to the rim. So this rim lock is actually handy in multiple different ways. If you're going to seriously be riding the Hawk 250, you need a rim lock. All right, so now we're looking at the parts bike. Before we tear into this thing, I just wanted to talk about it a little bit and why it makes sense to have a parts bike. So we'll start off with cost. This thing was only a couple hundred bucks. 
and the top end is completely roached the guy has a lot of missing pieces things like that but the rest of the bike only has 500 miles on it so i got it for just a couple hundred bucks and it is really really worth it so let me explain to you guys why so it all has to do with replacing parts on my bike economically so as you guys know if you go to buy just this rim brand new, you're looking at about 150 bucks. That includes the hub, the spokes, and the rim. Now, you don't get the tire and the tube. So that is another, at the bare minimum, $70 for a very cheap tire and tube. You have other parts, um, not to mention the rear, um, the rear brake system. Basically, the full brake system minus the pedal, that's another $150. Now, granted, I understand you might get lucky and find some of this stuff on eBay for cheap, but it's not every day of the week that you're going to find a deal on this stuff. And the last part that will be taken off is this shock, right around $70 for the shocks. So we add that up, we get right around $450 just for these couple parts that I'm going to be pulling off this bike. So if I had to buy these parts individually from Texas Power Sports or somebody on eBay, I could have bought two of these bikes and we're still going to have the entire rest of the bike to pull parts from. Hopefully this enlightens you guys and kind of instills into you why I've got a parts bike and why it makes so much sense to buy a parts bike, even if it is three or four hundred dollars. All right, so let's go ahead and tear into this parts bike and start picking parts off of it. All of the parts are off of both bikes. Um, so now what we're gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and put all the old parts on this bike just so obviously it's easy to roll around. Plus it's good practice so we don't lose any parts. Any of the old parts that I'm gonna be putting on this bike, I'm gonna actually label. There are a few parts that will not be transferring. So um, the sprocket, for example. In case you were wondering, this is the part that I was talking about that broke on the hub. Now it has uh, fully came apart. This is what the snap ring seats into, uh, at least part of it. The other half is still with the hub and uh it also holds the seal so you can see why we have a need for the entire wheel and tire and assembly Red one is done. Let's go ahead and put the blue one back together. Thought I'd share a tip with you, and I haven't really showed this in any of my other videos just because I haven't done it. Um, normally, I just uh, put my foot under the tire and lift the tire up. So what I'm talking about here is using um, normally wood blocks or whatever you have laying around. It might be toolboxes or toolkits or things like that. So what you're trying to achieve here is to get the hole that the axle goes in, um, the bearings, in line um, with basically the middle of this bolt. Or you're trying to line the hole of the um, of the hub up with the swing arm hole there. All right, guys, so it's back together with new parts. We got our brand new wheel assembly and uh, tire on there. Basically the whole back, back end is new pretty much. Uh, brand new brake stuff and we got our brand new shock on there. So uh, you guys can tell, I don't know 
if I ever showed you that bike up close, but I mean, this stuff really is like brand new. Um, and like I said, it's exactly what we needed. So on that note, um, a little bit about some of the modifications I've done to this bike. And um, like I said, to be quite honest with you guys, I've put a lot of work into modifications on this bike. So, I mean, to put this bike back together would be a ton of work because I'd have to turn right around and do every single modification to this bike that's already done to this bike. So um, real quick, a couple of those modifications. So the air box, um, that was a huge thing. It's real tough to get in and out. You have to disassemble the entire back end of the bike. So that's one thing, the swing arm, okay? Um, it's not only got reinforcements here, but reinforcements by the shock. And it's also got polyurethane bushings. Um, and yes, there are videos on every single one of these modifications on my YouTube channel. So um, go to my Hawk 250 playlist and scroll through it and you'll see all the stuff that's ever been done to this bike. Actually, I will link that playlist in the description box below. You guys can click on it. Um, and easily get to it and go check it out. I've also went through each and every individual electrical connection and I've greased every single electrical connection. We've done a lot of stuff, too much stuff really to even list, but we'll put it this way. Like I said, there is too much work into this bike to just up and leave it. So with all that being said, I just wanna wrap this video up by taking this thing on a little test ride. Massive, massive difference. So, um, <laughs> I mean, just a, a couple things like the wheel being aligned and a good shock makes a huge, huge, insane difference. Um, the brakes work really, really well too. You just barely step on them and, and uh, they work now. They'll, they'll lock the back tire up real easy. Well, that's gonna wrap this one up, guys. I hope you enjoyed watching. If you liked the video or found it interesting in one way or another, don't forget to rate, comment, and subscribe. Check out that description box below for other Hawk 250 videos and those links, I promise, they'll all be down there. And we'll catch you guys on the next video. Peace.